Welcome to The Intersection, a series on the IQT podcast where we discuss topics relating to the intersection of technology and national security. Today, we're going to discuss the nexus of AI and quantum technology and how it can address some of the world's most challenging problems. Our guest today is Jack Hittery, CEO of Sandbox AQ, which is an IQT portfolio company. Jack is a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of several tech companies, including Earthweb, Earthweb, Dice, and Vista Research. Jack is also the author of Quantum Computing, an Applied Approach, which is one of the leading textbooks in the field. Jack, thank you for joining us at the intersection today. Steve, it's great to be with you. So um, to set the stage for what we're going to talk about here today, why don't you share a little bit of your background and what led you to where you are today? Well, it's always been a dream of mine, Steve, to bring together different disciplines. Too often we find in academia in particular that disciplines are departmentalized, literally, and uh, never the twain shall, shall meet. What I found early in my educational career initially and then in building businesses and then ultimately joining Google is that we can actually bring these disciplines together. Uh, I had studied uh, computer programming and uh, coding since I was a kid and really loved that. I had then picked up a very strong interest in neuroscience and AI. Uh, the two obviously are deeply connected uh, back from the early days and even now. And then a deep passion for physics as well. I had combined all those in my various studies and educational areas. And it was always a dream to bring these disciplines together. Can we understand how to bring advanced computing, physics, uh, and other disciplines together to have really strong global impact and positive impact on society. And it took a while because when I first started having these dreams, Steve, uh, we didn't have the compute power as humans to make this happen. And so to see the rise of compute power, I'm sure today we'll be discussing both GPUs, QPUs, lots of other compute power. Now, finally, the dream is becoming true. Yeah. And what's the benefit of bringing both uh, 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 or multi disciplines uh, 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 together here as opposed to just focusing on the software, just focusing on the hardware? Yeah, well, I think it's exciting because the problems themselves are not restricting themselves to one silo. And right. so when you think about a problem such as uh, clean energy and making better batteries, both for electric vehicles, but also even bigger impact will ultimately be stationary uh, batteries for large scale buildings, as well as uh, fields of batteries for storage on the grid. When we think about pharma, we think about taking a molecule, making it into a medicine. These large societal challenges that we have do not neatly and conveniently restrict themselves to one discipline. They demand the tool sets of different disciplines coming together. Specifically, just to give one example, in pharma, in drug development and biotech, we have a, a major challenge in front of us. The average time, Steve, as you well know, that it takes to get from molecule to medicine is 13 years. The average money, two and a half to three billion dollars. The average failure rate, 70 percent failure. So that is a major challenge. And the reason why we as a society do not have the, the medical treatments we want to have today for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, brain cancer, pancreatic cancer, and, and others as well. These demand different disciplines coming together to address them. Okay. So you convinced me of the benefit of bringing uh, the different disciplines together, but that makes it a more complex challenge to uh, accomplish. You need to build a more complex or uh, 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 disparate skilled uh, uh, organization to, to, to accomplish this. Uh, uh, and all this started out within Google. So tell us uh, what you were challenged to do at Google and and, 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 and what you guys started doing there and then about your decision to spin out and leave Google. Sure. One of the beautiful things about Alphabet specifically, uh, the founders had set up Alphabet as a superstructure uh, to both own Google, but also to start new out of the box ideas and ultimately spin them out. And one of the beauties of Alphabet is the freedom to really explore tabula rasa, all kinds of new ideas and bring together disciplines. Uh, one of the things that my group and I did at that time in Alphabet is to bring in leading physicists into the picture, bring in AI folks, uh, build an AI group, build all this stuff. Because it was in the context of Alphabet and not in academia, we actually had a much easier time of doing that. The traditional walls between departments did not stop us. 
And so that was an initial early success that we had in Sandbox when we were inside of Alphabet. As we began to develop real product and real impact in these various areas, be it in cyber or be it in biopharma or other applications in quantum sensing that I'm sure we'll get to, we realized that it was time to spin this platform out. It was time to really have a dedicated resource pool of capital, to have an independent uh, equity instrument to attract the best and brightest, and also to be neutral in terms of embracing different chipsets. When we were inside Alphabet, we used a, a wonderful chipset in the TPU, the Tensor Processing Unit, very advanced chipset. But it was also important from a customer-centric point of view to respond to their need to use other chipsets as well, and also to respond to the different quantum computers that were being developed by many different entities, both venture-backed startups, large tech, academics, and others. So for all those reasons, about a year and a half ago, we then initiated the spin out and spun out in March of last year. And how many people uh, 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 came with you? Uh, at that time, we were several dozen people, but now uh, we've hit the 125 mark and two thirds of our folks are PhDs. Uh, the remaining are mainly engineers uh, beyond the initial core set of PhDs. And these are PhDs, Steve, that will not surprise you in physics, in chemistry, mathematics, cryptography, cyber, uh, AI, and many other disciplines. And Steve, maybe just also to throw a question back at you, since you and I have interacted so much, I find that InQtel, and we, we welcomed InQtel initially as a partner and then investor, um, you also have quite a few disciplines represented inside InQtel. Why was that important? Um, you've been at InQtel now, I think 17, 18 years, and now congrats, you just took on the role of CEO, so congrats on that. But, but tell me about uh, how that reflects in the kind of teams you've built at InQtel. A absolutely, uh, uh, and thank you for those comments, first of all. Um, to your point, at the end of the day, the customer agencies that we work with, they don't value technology for technology's sake. They value solutions. They value capabilities that uh, 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 we deliver in partnership with the portfolio companies that we invest in uh, that allow them to accomplish mission uh, uh, opportunities. And the best solutions are, I think, multidisciplined in orientation. They have hardware and software uh, uh, capabilities. And they allow, uh, when, when you have uh, different technologies brought together, they allow a more complex, holistic approach to whatever problem or, uh, uh, or objective the uh, agency is trying to address. In, in, in the multidiscipline approach of the solutions that we bring, sometimes we even end up helping our customer agencies integrate multiple products from different portfolio companies together to provide one solution, one capability that allows them to uh, better collect intelligence, uh, 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 surveil, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 adver adversaries and ultimately uh, uh, make policy recommendations uh, uh, through finished intelligence products to the uh, 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 government uh, customers that they serve. Yeah. So well, I think. I sorry. No. Go. Yeah. J just to just to pick up on that, you know, through our interactions with InQtel and others, it just as one example of what we're talking about. We were with um, an arm of the DOD just yesterday, and not to go into details here, but in, in general, um, national defense requires the use of frontier technologies, you know, and I think that that's been the mantra that we've heard from InQtel and the partnership that we've had, but also what we're hearing now more and more from other parts of the IC and the, the DOD and more broadly national defense uh, and allies people are now recognizing that, for example, material science. If you want to uh, build devices uh, that have certain properties and all you do is go back to the same materials that we've used for the past 20, 30 years, you will get the same results of the past 20, 30 yep. years. And what we're seeing in Ukraine is very, very interesting. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in the conflict from the conflict in Ukraine and in our support of Ukraine uh, to defend itself. Uh, certain technologies that we thought would work very well uh, are working. Others are not. Drones, for example, that we did not focus on as much. When I talk about drones, not just the very large predator the class. Small form form factor. Much small form yeah. factor drones. Uh, what we're finding is electronic warfare is far more important. And electronic defense of from EW 
is far more important than we may have initially imagined, where if, even if you have thousands of drones heading to the battlefront, most of those will probably be downed by electronic warfare. Thinking about technologies uh, that can navigate in a GPS-denied environment uh, has become much more urgent on the part of the U.S. and its allies as we see Russia jamming over Ukraine. We see other countries, other state, other nation states jamming GPS over large swaths of key regional areas that are of great strategic interest to the U.S., the Five Eyes, and its allies. What do we do in the face of GPS denial? And people sometimes have then moved to GNSS, a global navigation system, trying to pull from satellites from multiple constellations, but even those now have been jammed. And so what do we do? And so these challenges that are coming right in front of us from a national security and defense point of view, I think call for the use of frontier technology much more quickly, Steve, much more urgently. And I don't know what you're seeing, comparing notes with yourself at InQtel and your team, but I'm, I, you may be finding the same thing. No, absolutely. We have over 25 companies uh, that are contributing technology uh, uh, from our portfolio in, into the uh, conflict in Ukraine. Uh, uh, and what we're seeing is it's kind of a hacker uh, uh, conflict, right? It, 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 you know, there's certainly traditional, there's the role for certain traditional technologies and Munitions has been a big issue that, you know, I think uh, 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 the DOD has been publicly uh, 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 out there about uh, the need for uh, us to continue to manufacture and build uh, uh, certain munitions to supply uh, uh, the, the, the Ukraine forces with. But at the same time, what you're hearing over and over again is, you know, this technology didn't work the way it was envisioned in the uh, 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 design shop or, or in you know various military exercises. Now that we're on the field, we're learning things about this is how people jam, this is how people uh, 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 counteract what we're trying to do, and here's the hack that we figured out uh, to, to respond to that. So it's it, it's a class or almost makerspace type uh, 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 conflict here where everyone's deploying technology, learning from the interactions, and coming back and making uh, uh, modifications to it. And the small startup company that has been developing you know, frontier technology, your point, is better positioned to that than some of the large uh, uh, defense primes who, you know, have a much longer design cycle and the idea of making quick uh, uh, modifications to their technology to adapt to the uh, uh, environment that's out there it, it is a little bit more challenging uh, for them. Yeah. So see, maybe it's a good, I know that before our call, we talked about getting into navigation and yeah. navigation denied environment. So um, maybe this is a good moment for us to jump into that. So maybe yeah. if tell, tell us about what you guys are doing there, because I know what you're doing yeah. for it. Yeah. So and, and, you know, we've all parted around this because it's such an urgent issue, uh, both uh, in the conflict in Ukraine, but also globally. Uh, and when we've as collectively, uh, when we've designed, uh, be it jet fighters or ships or land based vehicles, it was always with the assumption that GPS would be there for us. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's now very apparent that GPS is very easy to deny. In fact, you can go online and uh, one can find um, a five to $700 device. It looks like a large walkie talkie. Uh, if one buys that, you can then jam GPS in an entire area. Uh, and uh, the adversaries, of course, are making use of that. Uh, technology to very easily jam and even spoof GPS, even more dangerously, uh, not letting you know that there's no GPS, but in fact, giving you a different GPS signal that can send a jet fighter off course. If you're now in the Pacific Ocean with no real landmarks, you can easily find yourself out of fuel. Uh, and that is a very dangerous situation, both in the security context, national security context, but also, and see, this is a topic you and I have always discussed, dual use, in the civilian context, just recently, two Qantas Airlines passenger jets full of passengers on March 14th of this year were denied GPS in international waters um, uh, by a nation state. And so this becomes of great concern, both in civilian aerospace as well as uh, national security and national defense. And so what could be done about this? And what we realized in Sandbox AQ a number of years ago is that we could bring A and Q together AI and quantum together to address this issue. You would need quantum, of course, because one thing we can be inspired by in a biomimicry sense is 
the way that birds migrate and the way that whales navigate as well. They both use the magnetic fields of the earth. Birds, in fact, have quite a few other modalities they use when visual cues are available, but they always also bring in a modality of navigation with the earth's magnetic lines. And what we now have realized uh, over the last number of years is that if you have a magnetic map of the earth, uh, each spot on the earth actually has a unique fingerprint, magnetic fingerprint, the way that our fingers have a unique uh, mark as well. And what we built at Sandbox AQ is a full stack where we have the sensor sensing the magnetic fields underneath the vehicle, be it land, sea, or air. We have a GPU in the box that can easily process that a magnetic image and then compare it to the map that it has stored in its brain. And then we have AI, and this is very, very critical, Steve, that you know of, to pull the signal from the noise. These quantum sensors are wonderful, but they're so sensitive that they can pick up the iPhone that's just a few meters away as well. And so pulling out the signal from the noise is a great job for machine learning and AI. So this is an example where quantum sensors, which are here today, we don't need error correction. We don't need scaling to millions of qubits the way we have to do in quantum computing. These are solid state devices that are here today and can be used today in mission critical contexts. Uh, coupling that with these GPUs, these graphical processing units that have become the mainstay of AI processing and also uh, image enhancement and processing, couple that with an AI model that we train on the appropriate data, that full stack allows for this kind of navigation. And we can now talk about it publicly. The Air Force announced that our device was placed um, on a C-17 Globemaster, not only across the US, but also in two or three contexts in a recent mission exercise in the um, Indo-PACOM or Pacific region. And so the successful run of these tests demonstrates that AI and quantum together can make magnetic navigation a reality this is a technology that does not communicate with any satellite, has no jamability because it, there's nothing to jam. Uh, there's no ability to find a frequency to jam. And so gives that countermeasure, the key countermeasure to GPS denial that we need. This is an example, correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, of uh, something that couldn't be done just with quantum or just with AI. It was the bringing together of the two disciplines that enabled uh, 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 your company to deliver this product that can be both positive for the uh, uh, military and defense uh, uses, but can also be used in the commercial setting uh, uh, as well. That's, yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. What we're seeing is that uh, AI is really good when you have a large amount of data to train on. Quantum is really good when you want to sense things you couldn't sense before, compute things you couldn't compute before. Yeah. They each have their strengths yeah. that the other does not bring to the table. Right. And bringing the two together, I think, is is rather critical. And um, maybe it's a good time now to discuss the new kinds of chips that we're seeing out there, the GPUs, and yeah. how that enables a new a new arena. But that's well. been the key enabling breakthrough on a technology to allow you to do what you're doing, right? It's been the advances on, on both the hardware side and the software side. But, uh, that, that's uh, correct. Yeah. yeah, on the hardware side, we, we've taken the academic work on quantum sensors that was very strong uh, and, and built over a 15, 20-year period, but applied for the first time engineering to that academic work to make it a mission critical uh, device that can be put under you know, mission circumstances. Again, that mission could be national defense in nature, or it could also be, of course, the mission of flying passengers safely in the civilian aerospace, which is a piece of critical infrastructure that the world would, our global <laughs> economy would collapse uh, without. And we, we saw that happen, of course. Uh, initially in the in the pandemic. So it's very important to have safety, both for civilian aerospace, as well as for the national defense. And these chips, these GPUs that, of course, were initially designed to help video game uh, graphics. And every time I see someone playing video games, if any teenagers around, I, I thank them for the video game playing because they they drove the innovation in GPUs that we have today. And of course, many companies such as NVIDIA, Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, uh, so many companies now uh, producing really wonderful chips that what we realize as a community, Steve, we can use the mathematics in these chips, this, this matrix algebra that was so essential to the firmware of these chips, the design of these chips, that we can then use that and translate that initially to neural networks, the 
brain inspired, the neuroscience inspired networks that led to deep learning, that led to transformers, that led to the LLMs of today and other applications, uh, and also now led to simulation. And that's a critical topic, Steve. If I can make one prediction here with you today, it's that as much as generative AI and LLMs and GPTs are the buzzword of this moment, uh, let me share a prediction with uh, the audience here that we have, which is that in a number of years from now, uh, but not too far in the distance, uh, the word simulation will be as much of a buzzword as generative AI. Because when we can simulate we're using a digital twin of an object, uh, be it a molecule, be it a new material, uh, be it a complex high dimensional risk analysis in financial services or in the theater of war. Um, simulation will have such a great impact that it will be a key tool and tool chest right alongside generative AI and other tools as well. And now you're doing something in the simulation area with uh, biopharma community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we, we can now talk about that. We, we kept that in stealth for some time, but now that we have so many proof points with real molecules uh, and real biologics uh, that can impact human uh, conditions, we can, now, we can now talk about that more publicly. And so specifically what we realized, and we mentioned this at the top of this podcast, that it's so difficult to get a molecule to become a medicine, so many challenges and Basically, it's littered with failure, more failure. About 70, 80% of these drug candidates fail in clinical trials. And 40% of that failure, Steve, which is really alarming, 40% of that failure is in phase three. And to remind ourselves, phase one is a small study for safety. Phase two, a slightly larger study for efficacy. And phase three is the scale up. That's where we have thousands and thousands of people. And to fail in phase three, as 40% of these drug candidates do, is not only costly from a monetary point of view, but costly from a societal point of view in that we don't get those drugs after yeah. all, that, all that work. So what we realized, Steve, is that we can combine the ideas of simulation and we can use GPUs. And this bucked conventional wisdom because conventional wisdom was that we'd have to wait to a scaled, error-corrected, fault-tolerant quantum computer to do this kind of simulation. And indeed, when quantum computers are scaled and we are working hard with all the partners we have building quantum computers, we're working hard to help those companies. We want that to happen. But what we realize is we can actually take the dimensionality of the problem down by quite a few notches and focus on say the business end, the electrons at the outer edge of a certain molecule as it's interfacing with a receptor in the body. And we could actually do that calculation at scale on large arrays of GPUs, not the GPUs of five to 10 years ago, but only starting 2021, basically just in the last two years, we could actually do this at scale with meaningful pharmaceutically relevant molecules and biologics. And that's indeed what we've now done at UCSF with that medical center and a Nobel Prize winning lab there, and now doing with pharma companies and biotech companies around the world. So yeah. this is a breakthrough, Steve, that both required bucking conventional wisdom and also a lot of innovation on both the AI and the quantum techniques that we use on GPUs. And I want to put stop one of the points that you made there, which is there's true value today being delivered by companies like yours they're using quantum techniques, even though we're not quite there yet on the sort of uh, uh, perfectly theoretical uh, quantum computer, right? There are still companies out there working hard uh, uh, to deliver that. That will come at some point. None of us are exactly sure when, maybe you have an opinion on that. But even before that, taking quantum techniques in uh, different areas, whether it's uh, sensing for navigation or simulation here uh, for biopharma, there's true value being delivered today uh, uh, by companies like uh, uh, Sandbox here. Uh, yeah, and what we'd love to see, Steve, and, and you know, we talked about this and our teams have talked about this. How can we take these simulation techniques and now move it to other adjacent key areas of impact, both for national defense and for the civilian sector? So examples that we could just highlight here and discuss, and I'd love your thoughts on them, would be in material science, for example, battery chemistry. Uh, we all care a lot about getting more renewable energy into the grid. It's very difficult to do that, though, without better storage. We know that there are choke points with lithium 
choke points that are geopolitical in nature and yeah. sourcing choke points as well. And so we need to move beyond these initial chemistries, but you're talking about a combinatorial runaway yeah. to explore the landscape of the periodic table to make new battery chemistries. Thoughts on that, Steve, from your point of view? No, absolutely. The, uh, the scale of exploration that we need to do to figure out where the new uh, chemistries uh, 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 exist that we can leverage for mission purposes. And yet these new chemistries may be more supply chain friendly to us than the current options out there is a very important and very strategic initiative for the United States as a country as a whole. You know, and, and that's not going to be done without a computational platform like the one that you uh, 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 are, are building or demonstrating that relies on quantum techniques, uh, uh, relies on AI techniques, relies on the latest and greatest uh, hardware. Uh, uh, we have to bring those things together to do these simulations, these computations, these explorations uh, 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 to, to identify these new chemistries because we've outsourced certain materials, certain manufacturing and certain energy sources to adversaries that can use their control over those uh, 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 capabilities to, uh, 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 to choke us. Now, Jack, I have a question for you. Um, as these types of new emerging technologies be more, become more critical to the defense and intelligence community, how do we increase the technical sophistication of the workforce uh, 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 in these communities so that they can understand the potential uh, better and take more advantage of them more quickly as they do emerge? It's a very fundamental question. It's a question we dedicate a lot of time and resources to. Uh, we've set up a pro bono philanthropic arm of Sandbox AQ, uh, uh, Sandbox AQ EDU, and it's not just for universities. It's actually more than half our focus is on upskilling the workforce that's in the workplace today, yeah. be it in the government sector, be it in the private sector. Now, I would highlight, Steve, three buckets of individuals, three cohorts of individuals that we focus on because they each need very different materials and very different curricula given their various constraints. The first would be the C-suite, the, the leadership, again, either in a DOD or IC context or in the private sector context. Uh, we have found that, that you cannot throw a 10-week course on Coursera with lots of coding uh, you know, at um, uh, folks at that level. It's just simply not going to be a very good fit. And what, what really people are looking for at the C-suite level uh, and the uh, secretary level you know, across agencies and departments uh, is the key conceptual takeaways and understanding of frameworks, how to put in context a new announcement about a new AI development, a new quantum development, um, how to put that in context. The first message we have on AI is that AI is not just about generative AI. A generative AI is wonderful, uh, and we and many others participated in doing this. I've been building neural networks for many, many years. 1991 is my first neural network. So been around for a while building out neural networks and deep learning. Uh, then we didn't have deep learning, of course, because our computation wouldn't supply it. But, but we had some, uh, some neural networks nonetheless. The point is that we need to enable our C-suites and our leaderships in government to understand that generative AI is one piece of a much larger AI picture. And similarly on the quantum side, that quantum computing, which gets 90% of the attention and we're excited about quantum computing and moving it along, we also need to look at quantum cyber, um, cyber, you know, quantum safe cyber security, which hopefully we'll get to in a minute, uh, quantum communications, quantum sensors, very important technology as well. So. Basically, what we found is we need to give the C-suite a framework to have context for all the announcements that they see coming out. The second cohort will be the program managers, be it at uh, an agency of the government or be it in uh, a large company. And then, of course, the actual engineers, PhDs, the people who are often coding and building the actual products themselves. Uh, we have we've put out now YouTube channels and other channels to provide engineers with deeper curriculum. In fact, many universities now have taken that up and are incorporating that into their curriculum as well. So three cohorts, context setting we found is the critical aspect. Instead of just throwing a lot of mumbo jumbo facts at people, can we give people a framework? Yeah. So uh, we are running out of time here and we absolutely should not leave this conversation without talking about quantum 
uh, uh, safe uh, cybersecurity. So uh, 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 what, what are you guys working on there? Well, I think it's a critical issue. Again, it's a dual use issue. It's both civilian sector and public sector. Uh, we need to address this. This is a critical challenge for all of us listening in today uh, and for yourself and myself, Steve. And, and our two organizations have been collaborating on this. Um, very, very important issue. The fact remains that uh, before we even we get to the quantum safe issue, one of the reasons why there's still so many breaches, be it on the public or private sector side, is that we need to move to a zero trust architecture, ZTA as it's known in the biz. And ZTA says, assume that the attackers break through your outer wall. You've got to just assume that that's gonna happen. With that as, as in mind, we need to make each file, each application, each key management system, each library, its own fortress. And to do that, we need to use an AI-driven systematic approach that can look at millions of files in a large enterprise, be it government agency or be it in the private sector, and analyze for its encryption technology. What is encrypting that file with 100 million social security numbers? What is encrypting that file with proprietary top secret information in a government agency. What we find, before we even get to the quantum piece in a minute, is that often, for example, a password file might be using a hashing protocol such as SHA-1 or MD5. Protocols, as you know, Steve, that were broken in 2000 and 2009, respectively, and not right. broken by a quantum computer, but broken by a simple laptop. And so then we turn to the quantum issue where we know for certain Quantum computers ultimately will crack the public key cryptography protocols we use today, be it RSA, be it uh, ECC, elliptic curve cryptography. And for that, and here's the good news, a great shiny example of government doing great work with itself and partners is the work of NIST. I want to really give kudos in this, in this podcast here today to the great folks at NIST and other folks and other agencies in the IC that supported NIST in this respect to run a seven-year process that just came to a good conclusion last year to analyze 82 different potential candidates for a replacement for RSA, for public key cryptography encryption, and in fact came out with Crystal's Kyber for the CHEM, for, that is, CHEMs are used to transmit keys across the internet, and of course, looking at a number of candidates for digital signature as well. That The standardization process will take about another year to wrap up, but tremendous work on the part of public and private individuals coming together in a peer reviewed open process across many countries, allowing the community to come together and say, we now have a roadmap of a quantum safe standard for replacing RSA. Major accomplishment in the last number of years, just happened July 5th last year. And so now with that in hand, we can do both discovery and we at Sandbox AQ provide AI-driven discovery tools to analyze millions of files and tag them for triage movement to quantum safe encryption, but also remediation. Remediation will not be a simple process. It will take years to get all these files and protocols into the new standards. But that's the work of the next few years, Steve. Well, that's fantastic. I think that's a great place to, uh, 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 to end, but uh, I just want to reiterate your point. I think it was a great public-private partnership action by the government to, 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 to run that study or that competition, if you, if you will. And, and I think it will really help benefit uh, 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 a lot of different companies, a lot of different efforts in this area. I'd like to thank the audience today for tuning in to the episode uh, of The Intersection. Please make sure to subscribe to the IQT podcast so you don't miss out on future content and leave us a review or comment to let us know what you think or what content you'd be interested to see us cover in future podcasts. Also, you encourage you to check out IQT's website at www.iqt.org to explore more content about cutting-edge technology to support and deliver insights and capabilities essential for national security mission impact. Jack, thank you for taking the time here today. If people want to find out more information about what you and your company are up to, is there any place on the web you want to appoint them to? Sure. I think we'll probably provide the URL, sandboxaq.com. Uh, we also have a number of YouTube channels and books and other materials pro bono curriculums that people can use to upskill themselves and their communities. And we encourage people to reach out to us uh, and reach out to the many companies now working at the frontier of these technologies to impact both 
um, the national defense and security, as well as critical industries in uh, the, the private sector as well. Great. Well, Jack, thank you for joining us at The Intersection, and uh, we'll talk to everyone next time. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.